welcome to creating an animated TV show pilot. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. So, I'm Ian Carl King, the filmmaker and composer. This is Martin Pursley, the writer and Freemason. So they're sitting in a chair by him. Well, I don't know what happened Where to the person. Where are you and why? I'm in a fire tower in West Virginia. That's really random. Um, Hundreds of cool. feet in the air. Wow. Alone. <laughs> it's where he does his best writing. And this is Joan Brooke. Oh, Joni. Wait. Joni. Mm, close enough. I'll take it. Joni Brooks, voice actor and model. Yeah. Uh, a quick sad note of remembrance, uh, John Schnepp is not with us, he unfortunately passed away a couple of months ago, which was very sad, he wanted to be here at the panel, he agreed to be here, and we lost him, uh, but he did appear in the show as the voice of Blue Door, so in memory of John Schnepp, we are here. So, quick, real quickly, the plan. We just did the introduction. We're going to do a quick screening of the uh, pilot, which is about 11 minutes long. And then I'll do a presentation on breaking down how we did everything. Uh, and then we'll do some Q&A. So let me find the video file and we'll play it. Previously on the Oracle Outer Space. Okay, so now that we've watched that insanity, we are going to cover a few topics on how we put this thing together from scratch and uh, some of the problems we uh, encountered. Finding a concept, character design, writing, voice acting and recording dialogue, radio play editing, text animatic, and we will not be covering storyboarding or animatic or animation uh, because our animator could not make it out from Austin, Texas but we will talk about him a little bit more later in the presentation. So in 2015, I decided I wanted to make a sci-fi fantasy cartoon. And step number one, which sounds very obvious and simple, but this is the most important and crucial, is you need to decide you will do it somehow. You need to commit to doing it. This is what I'm going to do. I have no clue how, but I'm going to find out the steps. So this is just the container that you're going to walk around in your life with, in your daily life trying to find something to, what am I going to make a cartoon about? So that's very easy, but it's also very hard. Step two is finding a concept to fill the container. So some potential sources, uh, you could have a hobby or a personal passion, a life experience, an unusual interest, and you just want to take your time on this and look around and let it be in your subconscious and think, no, it'll see if it uh, lines up and fills that container. So my unusual interest was Art Bell. I grew up listening to him in Florida. I don't, how many people have heard of Art Bell? Look at that. All right. So he was the original creator and host of Coast to Coast AM, which was a late night AM radio show about UFOs and paranormal and weird stuff. And the callers were really strange because they were you know, truck drivers in the middle of nowhere calling at 3 AM to just off-topic, weird stuff. Like, and I, we tried to kind of emulate that in the cartoon. It's just some of the nonsense during the pledge drive. And if you listen back to Art Bell, you'll hear those same types of people calling. It's very strange. So I was, we were on a road trip, me and the wife, and we went uh, out near Area 51 in Nevada. And we stopped at this weird little mobile home thing that it was converted into a sort of roadside cafe. Uh, about, you know, alien theme kind of thing. And we drove past Art Bell's house at the time. We just Googled it, found his address. That's like, drove past the point, and like, there it is. <laughs> cool. And it was just a cool thing to be in the place where Art, where Coast to Coast AM was created and where Art Bell lived. And you just start getting a vibe of like, wow, that came out of this little place. Mm. Very interesting. Very inspiring. Yeah. So that was when I had the eureka moment of, I miss Art Bell and AM radio, and I'm going to make a sci-fi fantasy cartoon, and there it is. 
the, the, the moment of uh, Eureka, uh, the last AM radio station in outer space was the concept. So step number three after that, I jumped into the character design because you could start into the writing, but I wanted to kind of create the look of some of the characters first because I knew it was going to be like a sci-fi fantasy thing. And I was going for variety. And so I intentionally wanted half women, half men. I wanted uh, different races, human, robot, alien, different sizes, different shapes, different colors, uh, different personalities. I thought of some of them as like classes in D&D. Some of them, like one would be like a fighter type, another one would be like a mage, uh, a bard. What's, what's my type? What's your type? Yeah, what am I? I thought, well, we're, gonna, we're gonna find out. <laughs> It will all be revealed to you who you truly are. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, so I started putting together a sort of character lookbook and references. So I just went on the internet and I started grabbing some images that I thought were uh, like I want this guy to, like uh, got like a evil barbarian on the top left. You've got this uh, that '70s show character who I based the uh, Gary Shostakovich main character uh, uh, station manager on. There was uh, the sorceress from He-Man, which is kind of based on you know, her idea. The what is that? The Martian Manhunter or something? I don't know. So, uh, and then this robot. So you can see how the original layout transformed into the characters there. And originally, this character was I did when we first started writing it. The characters just had like placeholder names. Like this is sexy goddess sorceress. Ah, oh, very catchy. Yeah. <laughs> and so you can see the little parts of that character design, the references slowly translated into being that character. And I sent them over to Lance, the um, character designer and animator, and he was able to uh, build some pretty interesting things. Real quick, I just want to say if you're going to try to create an animated show, you should learn the basics of the different departments that are involved in making a show. Read some screenwriting books, learn storytelling and writing, do some basic flash animation, just basic stuff. Not, you don't have to get complicated. Some audio recording, video editing, graphic design, and I unfortunately worked in a lot of those jobs over the years, or fortunately, I don't know, it could be good or bad. I got here, it's okay. Uh, but you just need to get into the basics, what you can easily do and what you can't easily do, and that'll help you sort of run the show when, when you're hiring someone, you know, like, I'm not gonna give this person something extremely difficult to do that can be done more simply. And just learn from anywhere and everywhere. Like I took some classes on lynda.com. They had a great character animation course, which it, it helped me do my first Frank Zappa character animation. You can get for dummies books, which I have plenty of those, listen to podcasts, or just ask someone who does it, ask for some tips, show them what you're doing. So now we're gonna get into the writing of it. And I have to say that you must spend as much time, energy, and money if you can on the writing process. Uh, because without the writing, you have nothing. You should just give up. No, don't give up. <laughs> but for each character, you want to develop a sort of psychology, central goal and obstacle for that character. What does each character want to get, and what or who is stopping them from getting it? Give each character habits and tics, uh, distinct speech patterns, extreme political views, maybe, too many social graces or zero social graces, a biggest fear or a secret. Joni's character has a secret. I don't know if it's, it, it doesn't come out in this episode, but we're holding on to it. Oh, whoops. <laughs> I'm not good at that. Uh, so, uh, how can you set up the characters to annoy each other, is what I was trying to think of. Um, and because if everyone gets along, there's no fun interaction. So you want opposites and, opposites and tension, conflict. Like in the beginning, uh, uh, previously, on, in the, on the Oracle of Outer Space, whatever, uh, Dream Girl number 11 and 9 and Arcana are having a sort of fight where Dream Girl 11 and 9 shoots her head off and it grows back immediately. Uh, so, you also want some irony if you're doing a comedy. You want the appearance of the character and their behavior and voice to counteract each other. You don't want them to always line up. You don't want a huge, powerful barbarian 
necessarily to sound like a big powerful vulgar. You want him to be a sort of nice, kind of friendly guy, which is what we did with John Schnepp's character, Blue Door. Writing tips. Uh, break the writing and editing into two separate processes or processes. So don't judge while you're writing, don't judge yourself. Just write and dump ideas into the document. Keep going and write as many ideas as you can. Um, don't worry about the grammar when you're typing it out, like if you have some dialogue, just write the crappy version of it to get from A to B. Uh, because it does work, it helps you keep going so you don't get stuck on, I can't write this one sentence really cool. Um, skip it, come back later. Uh, Brendan Small of Metalocalypse says, get the bad version of the script out of the way first. Then go back and edit. Save everything you don't use for later. So our first draft on this thing was like 45 minutes long. I think Martin says it was. I don't. Yeah. I, it, it really was 45 yeah, minutes. It was. It was about 50 pages <laughs> worth of just nonsense. Yeah. And so it was supposed to be 11 and a half minutes, and there's no way to fit 60 pages or whatever it is into that. Um, but that's okay because you just want to trim it down and get as many ideas as possible because you never know where one of those little ideas might lead. One of the characters might mention toast and you're like, oh, the toast thing. And about keeping that. Um, the best idea in the end wins. So Aaron Sorkin says that the purpose of dialogue uh, it needs to do one of two things. Either reveal something about the character or move the story forward. And if it does neither of those, then get rid of it. And I say maybe because I think back and maybe there could be some cool lines from movies that didn't do either of those and they were just cool lines. Who knows? What do we know? We don't know anything. We don't know. Do a little bit of research and analysis. Take some episodes of your favorite show and analyze them. Transcribe them into script format for practice. You can learn a lot just by copying what someone else did that you are a fan of. Uh, don't, I don't mean copy by ripping off, I mean through the process of learning. So take a scene or episode and ask, why is this working? Like, just type it out and go through it and analyze it. And uh, what is the counter element that allows that thing you like to work? So I, uh, we did this with uh, Metalocalypse and Harvey Birdman, or not Harvey Birdman, but uh, Aqua Teen Hunger Force episode. We just typed them out word for word and like, okay, what's going on here? How many words do they have? How many lines of dialogue back and forth? How many characters? And just looking to how is this thing working? You know? So editing is the other process, other part of writing, and it largely consists of deleting things, things that you're probably in love with, those other 60 pages that you know are never going to get into this thing. There's just no way. Uh, the common rule is if you can delete it and the story still works, then delete it. And when in doubt, cut it out, as they say. Uh, plot, quick note on this. The Oracle pilot is not a three-act structure. Uh, we sort of end at the beginning of Act 3, the cliffhanger, because usually in Act 3 there's a the hero or protagonist solves the problem that has been built up in Acts 1 and 2. And I, I wanted to do that because I like the way that Lost always seemed to end in Act 3 in a way, so that the scenes were kind of staggered where you're always ending on Act 3 and wanting to see what happens next. Um, so a tip is to keep the plot sparse, not a lot of beats and scenes. So try to leave space for the character interaction and discussion. And here's a tip for forward motion and tension. Avoid resolution of problems. If there's a problem, just let it eat away. Um, a or a solution to the problem causes a new problem. Uh, like if there's fire and someone gets a fire hose, gasoline sprays out of it. Oops, now we have a new problem. Uh, and every scene can get erupted, uh, interrupted and just keep pushing things forward. So there's always something new happening. Uh, you've probably seen this movie. Uh, focus on the relationships or think of them as chemical reactions between the characters. And not just, you don't want just this impersonal external plot element of like the hero goes to get this thing and then he beats up the bad guy and gets the thing and then it's over. You want like character A to annoy character B you know, when they're stuck in a small place, like this weird van that they're driving around in. So they're stuck together on this adventure, and you need to get them interacting and doing things to each other to propel them forward. 
So knowing that, learning these things, these are things we could have improved or fixed uh, with another writing or rewriting pass. One of the problems is we got better at writing as we wrote. And the first few drafts were very chaotic and random because I have the sensibility or sense of humor of the Adult Swim, uh, Space Ghost, Coast to Coast, Aqua Teen stuff where it's just insanity the whole time. And then it started becoming more and more clear that we really need a story here. This actually needs to make some sense, which we try to do. Um, the characters need to spend more time chewing on the events and talking amongst themselves about what strange thing just happened. Um, the rhythm had a problem with too many things happening too fast with no pauses. Uh, I'm a musician and I would never write music that's like wall to wall notes without a rest, but that's what we ended up with here because we ran out of time on the writing. Um, some of the Kickstarter backer voices should have been minor characters. Those were all Kickstarter backers who uh, pledged for a certain level who got to be a character, and then we used them as the random callers who called in to pledge to support the radio station. Um, maybe we should have spread them out throughout the show. Like maybe even skip the pledge drive and integrate those characters into the plot. Like maybe make them a delivery person or a repairman or a janitor or an intern or a pet. So learn from our mistakes watching this. Um, if you go with your first instinct, you can kind of get stuck in it. And you should always question if there are better options for everything. Tip dialogue, this concept called multiple strokes that comes from transactional analysis, if anybody's into psychology. All right, so an example, curb your enthusiasm. Larry David and his friends will observe something around them. And then they'll talk about it for many strokes, back and forth. And each reply in the conversation <coughs> is a stroke. Like, did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. Can you believe what you just did? I can't believe it. This is unheard of. You can't just do that. Oh, I know. Absolutely not. That's just unacceptable. So that's like five times saying the same thing. Whereas in our writing, we would have just written it once and then moved on to the next topic. And it doesn't let the, the subject like settle in, digest it. And, you know, uh, it accomplishes two things to do this. Because number one, it's funny to see two people obsessing and getting upset over a petty occurrence like Larry David would. And it serves as an exposition because the audience has a better chance of following the story and understanding what happened. Maybe when our characters set a line, maybe you were looking at the three boobs and you didn't catch what was supposed to be conveyed. Uh, so sometimes just repeating and having them comment back and forth really helps. Quick note on writing tools and software. Industry standard tends to be final draft, which is expensive. I did buy it, and then we didn't use it. So I wasted several hundred dollars there. Uh, also, Celtics, I think it's pronounced. It's a free version, which we've used in the past on some stuff, and that works fine. But for this, we decided to use plain old Google Docs. And we just wanted to make it easy. We didn't want to worry about all the, I mean, it's in script format but it's not the most beautiful thing you'd ever look, look, look at. It's, it's not, things with the, the, the titles are not tagged and all those things. There's a lot more professional way to do it, but we wanted to be able to get in just mess with it and copy paste and drag things around. I didn't want Martin worrying about the formatting or Ian, the other uh, co-writer. You want to be able to get in with your phone and mess with it when you're sitting on the toilet or waiting in the car or whatever you're doing. Like, you know, oh, I have an idea for a line. Let me look at this line. You want to get into it. You don't want to mess with go home, get the laptop, pop open final draft, load the file, load the file. So you just want to make it easy. Um, and the other good thing about Google Docs is it has a version history. So you can see if you have multiple writers, we have the three writers, you can see who wrote and changed and deleted stuff. So Martin could go back and see that I deleted all of his lines. And, and then, that I, sort of, then I quit. Yeah, then you quit. We got him back. So this is Martin personally. This is a, the best photo I could find of him. <laughs> and I wanted to uh, quickly draw some attention to him and ask him a question. Uh, we talked about this a little bit before, but I write with Martin because he has a different writing style than I do. I have a very straightforward, simple writing style. Like when I write dialogue, I'll write, character will say, I feel sick. I'm just like, it gets the idea out, That's, but now, Martin, how do we make I feel sick 
more interesting or funny? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is curiosity, so curiosity about the language. Um, is there another way that, that we can say this? Is there another adjective that we can throw in there? Uh, is there another synonym? So uh, when you have a piece of dialogue, thinking through it, can I substitute a word to make it not make sense but still retain the, the initial feeling behind it? That, what would that mean, not make sense? Like, what do you mean by that? Um, so, I'll give you an example. Uh, it was in the deleted scenes. So, uh, I'll do some sort of background on this. So, the, there's a scene where uh, there's a the human annihilator and then there's uh, blood rushing out of Dr. C. Ross's ears. So, the way that came out, uh, I was thinking about a um, story I heard once about uh, therapist who was working with someone who was obsessively vacuuming her rug. Like she couldn't stand footprints on the rug, couldn't, couldn't handle it. She was vacuuming her rug all day, couldn't do anything. And he was sort of asking her question, so what, what does it mean when there are footsteps on the rug? Oh, some, someone walked through here and I, now I have to vacuum it again. And he said, well, what, what does it mean if there are no footsteps? And she said, well, that would mean that no one was there and I would be all alone. And I thought, that's interesting. Let's do the opposite. So Dream Girl 11 of 9 hates people and wants to get rid of any trace of humanity. So of course she's going to love a vacuum that's loud, obnoxious, and sucks up dander and fecal particles and saliva to obliterate humanity. So great. So there's, there's the concept. There's the human island. She's using it, it's very loud, and Dr. Ziraz says, oh, my, my ears hurt. You know? So I was thinking, okay, now, Dr. Ziraz, he's talking about my ears. Um, I think you've damaged them. So what is it here? That would be like my boring. Like yeah, like, exactly. How you damaged my ears. Exactly. <laughs> you've damaged my ears. So what, what can we do with that? So ears, what do they do? They, they receive sound. Okay, so it's a sound receptacle. It's a sound... Uh, a sound hole. Okay, so that's getting closer, um, but they're damaged, they're getting ruined, so they're obviously very delicate, very gentle. Um, what else is delicate and gentle? Rabbits. So let's have Dr. Ziraz refer to his ears as his sound bunnies. It makes no sense. It makes no sense, but within the context of him bleeding and the scene getting deleted, uh, it's a brilliant piece of writing, Carl. <laughs> it is. So that's an example of how Martin will fix something that, you know, if I write the shitty version to get past that dialogue, like, here's what the character's going to do, basically. Now let's go back and mess with it. Yeah, you, you explore it. So you, you ask yourself those questions. What does this mean? What does it do? How else could it be represented? Uh, what are other things that could slide in there that could kind of make sense but also be interesting to the person who's watching it. Very good. I would clap, but I have a... Very good, Martin. Clap for me. Yeah, that was great. In 20 years of working with you, I've always wondered, what is that trick that Martin is using to be a good writer when I'm such a bad writer? Yeah, now you can fire me. Now I can fire you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we're going to move on to voice actors. Uh, finding and choosing voice actors. The good news is you don't have to look far because everyone wants to be a voice actor. And the bad news is everyone wants to be a voice actor. Uh, oh, look at that. The cast slide is screwed up. Real quick, I'll run through the cast. Uh, Dweezil Zappa played the main character. Uh, Frank Zappa's son, that's Dweezil Zappa, if you've never heard of him. Gary Shostatanovanovich, the station manager. Joni Brosis here was Arcana Price. <laughs> Leanna Vamp, who just got back from New Zealand and couldn't join us, uh, was the ship's computer, that weird video game, crane game with the fluffy animals in it, who's uh, in a love triangle with Gary and uh, another character down the line. John Schnepp played Blue Gore, and he was extremely enthusiastic. He was actually one of the first people I, I texted him one day and said, um, 
By the way, does anybody know who John Schnepp was? Did you ever really recognize that? Yeah. All right. He was a huge character here at Comic-Con, a huge presence, a creative force. He was always here. You'd see him everywhere, outside, standing around, at his booth. He was just always around. Um, so it was very cool when I texted him and said, hey, I'm going to do this cartoon, and he instantly responded, I want to do a voice. And I'm like, holy crap, okay, all right, well, let's do that. So, uh, Mike Keneally, who was in Frank Zappa's band, an incredible musician, uh, played the part of Dr. Xeroz, the green guy with pink blood and the, the pink pooping problem. He seems to poop everywhere. Have you ever heard of this phenomenon of where People go around, there, there would be like a mysterious pooper in an office building. Like you're working and well, you don't know who it is, but one of your coworkers poops in a drawer every day and they can never catch the person. Why? <laughs> so that's what this guy is kind of based on. He goes around pooping, but he's also ironically the janitor of the station. He's an awful janitor and he's trying to start a cult. <laughs> yeah, he's a complicated character. <laughs> Ebony Amber was an amazing uh, sort of costume designer out in, uh, I don't know where she lives, somewhere on the East Coast. But she played Dream Girl number 1190 because she had this very sweet voice, and I wanted a sweet little girl voice coming out of this evil robot that wanted to kill everyone. Um, Clark Wolf, uh, who is not, also not here, uh, she'll be here tomorrow. Played the vice demi regent of public programming in matter, matter of affairs, who was Gary's ex girlfriend. Nils Rurak, one of my friends, played the announcer, German guy. I thought he was, has a funny voice, so I had to use him. Travis Orban, the drummer, played the scientist with the space scorpions all over his face. Mike Stone played Big Herb. And Zeke Pystra from the back row over there, hiding. He came in and said the line, Ronald, that which actually came out of Cole's mouth one day <laughs> when we were at uh, oh WonderCon. We were at WonderCon, we got an Uber or something like that. His name was Roger. His name, was his name Ronald? I think his name was Ronald. And he just spit out like, Ronald that. <laughs> I just thought that that was a hilarious thing. It stuck with me. I was like, I have to use that. And I like, popped open my phone and jotted it down. Like, that's going in something. Right, everything Cole says down is all ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so back on this whole topic of voice actors. You have to become the asshole producer and project, uh, protect the project at that point because everybody will start calling you and wanting to do a voice. So you need to. Uh, I had to set a rule and be like, all right, from the producer hat perspective, and I don't always like all the parts of being that, I could only cast people, uh, and I actually told someone this, and I was like, I'm sorry that I can't cast you because you have to have both a striking voice and your own audience. And because it has to be a dual marketing and creative decision. So it had to be, uh, when you're casting a movie, you need to bring in, people go to see movies to see actors in it, and that's the way that I do this. Um, and also, working with someone who's enthusiastic goes an extremely long way, and I have to say, this is the craziest thing to have come up with a character and then see someone dressed as that character. That is the first time I've ever that happened. Very cool. And she immediately, when I emailed her, was like, hey, I have this project I'm doing, do you want to do a voice? Like, yes! Okay. Let's do it. Yes, I'm going to do it. Okay. I was so worried it wasn't real. Really? <laughs> I was so excited, but I was worried. I was like, because I get a lot of emails with cold projects, and I'm like, eh, I have to be very careful because some people are just like, yes, there's a party in my basement. Like, so, like, what a voice act in my basement. Like, I didn't know, so I was like, I was really, really excited, but I was like, okay, I gotta, you know, research this and stuff. But I remember getting that email, and I was freaking out. I was so excited because. And I was worried it, it still wasn't real. Like every single time we, we went back real. and forth, I was like, oh man, <laughs> I'm gonna wake up. <laughs> so her enthusiasm immediately, like through this whole thing, has been huge because I can be, you know, down on the project and feeling like, oh, this isn't going well, this is, this is gonna fail, or something like that. And then I think, I can't let Joni down because she's so excited <laughs> about so it. Don't yeah. kill my dreams. <laughs> yeah, so she's like holding it together over there. Um, 
So since this was funded with Kickstarter, I had to get the main actors. I needed them to help to promote it. And uh, so you've got to work with people who are excited about the project and want, want it to succeed. Because if you just hire a professional voice actor who does this all the time, it might be just another gig for them. Maybe, maybe not. But you need someone who's going to like be in the band with you. Um, recording dialogue. This is a photo of Leanna Vamp at my studio recording her parts. Quick tips on recording dialogue. Dry room. You don't want a bathroom with lots of echo. You don't want to sound like you're in a tank. Uh, you don't want a bunch of reverb. If there's going to be reverb in the scene, you want to be able to add it later. Um, use a condenser stand. A condenser mic on a stand with a pop filter. Um, I mostly use the Shure KSM32 with the Millennia preamp, but you don't need all that. Just try to get a good quality mic in a quiet room. And when I'm recording voiceover, it helps me to go line by line, isolate each line. Sometimes it's also good to do a pass with the whole block of text and paragraph. But try to be like, all right, let's, let's do this sentence. And just get it loaded into their mind. This is what it means, and this is what it's supposed to feel. Let's try a few versions of that. Because if you just hand them the script, it doesn't and then make they, any sense. <laughs> they start reading the text, and it's a paragraph this long, and they just start checking out mentally and losing it. Um, so they have to mean every line, and a good voice actor will make a character come to life. I have to say that every one of the, the lead voice actors that I use, who are not usually working voice actors, everybody I cast in this, immediately their first line was just like, Oh my god, I just heard the character, like the first line. And it was actually, I was beating myself up reading the script so much, I recorded the whole thing just myself at home with all the characters. I was like, this this is a disaster. I think I called you and I was like, this doesn't, this Yeah, you're, you're this a draw. You, you sent it to me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, you probably have the recording somewhere. It embarrass me a lot. I do, I yeah. do. Um, <laughs> I was yeah, I, so I listened back to it and um, yeah, you were awful. It was, oh, it was absolutely a mess. Oh, I remember that you, you telling me uh, when I recorded, you were really like, you're like, oh, I'm not, I'm not feeling this, so let's try it out. You're, you were still yeah. like, yeah, you were really? still pretty bummed on that recording, yeah. On my recording? No, oh, yeah. Doing it myself? Yeah. 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 Oh, we yeah. were bummed out, and I was like, yeah. oh, let's do this. We'll fix it. <laughs> yeah. Well, recording it yourself and doing it, all this work, all this writing and editing. Finally, you go back and record it, and you're like, I don't know what I'm listening to. I don't know what this is. This is what is this? This is a bad idea. I should have never done it. Um, so yeah, so having Joni say her first lines, it was like, there it is. She saved it. And I remember Leanna's first line that came out as the computer voice. I, would, I just hit stop. It's like, you just fucking nailed it. Like, that was, that was the character. That was it. It's going to be OK. It's going to be OK. Yeah. That's you recording. <laughs> so you have to find the character's voice um, instead of uh, being rigid with it. You can't go in with this preconceived idea of what the voice is going to sound like. Um, so I think I think that the voice should be a natural part of the person already, and uh, it'll often be as close to their real voice as possible. Like Joni didn't need to do a lot to her voice to make it yeah, and to make a character. Pitch more excited. And or an asshole. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of cussing, and you had a little bit of a, a secret southern accent that came yeah. out. Yeah, that helped, because uh, I, I actually grew up in Alabama for a little bit, so I kept that with me. And so when I get really excited, sometimes you can hear a little bit of southern in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so most of the characters, I just had them do stuff that was very similar to their normal voice. You know, I, I would give him a voice and be like, okay, tweak it this way. And it was so much easier to like just give him my voice and then he could go, you know, higher pitch, lower pitch, more twang, less twang. It was, it was a really fun process. Yeah, it was like we're sitting there in a the studio across from each other with glass and we're just being like, oh, a little bit more like this. Yeah. It was fun. fun. It's so fun. But the point is that you have to find the voice with the actor, I think. that That's, that's a style that I would prefer to go with, the technique I like. Because you don't want to go in there rigidly and be like, oh, Joni, this, this isn't going to work because you can't do this thing that I had in my head. Goodbye. Okay. Like, that was totally... <laughs> oh, 
I and, feel ruined in my dreams. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's not about that. It's about like you in any any situation you can't go in with this firm, rigid thing. It's a process of let's figure out what it is together. Uh, and you need to be willing to adapt and change the character based on what is coming out of the actor's mouth. Uh, so that's a big thing. It's kind of meeting in the middle and co-creating it. All right, a few quick dialogue tricks. We're almost through this thing. Dialogue trick number one, have multiple lines and options written into the script. So, and find out which one works better later. The more options in editing, the better. So you don't have to just stick to that one rigid script when you write the line. I need this character to say this. Well, what if there's three options for what the character can say? Because they'll give you more choices later. Number two, have multiple actors and characters say the same line. Because then later you can pick the character that said it the best. Dialogue trick number three, record random lines of dialogue for each character. Anything you can think of off the top of your head. We made like a little list of like, Joni, just scream yes or no or... Oh, smells funny. Yeah, and, and that ends up being like, oh, I can have... <laughs> yeah, and it's like, so now I can have that character say that, and now I can have another character in the next voice recording react to something that she made up in the, on the spot or some random thing at work. Like, oh, I like the way that she said something about poop or whatever. It's like, let's get the other characters set up next time. And say hello like 20 times too. I remember hello, hello, hello. Yeah. <laughs> just all over the place, but different reactions of hello. Yeah, and just like a bunch of screaming and just random. That was my favorite part too. Yeah. Oh gosh, that was great. I was just blubbering and screaming. And it's so funny because you're in such a quiet area because like you said, there's like, no reverb or anything. So you're just in this quiet area screaming to yourself. <laughs> so any of those kinds of things can help you in the edit later to solve problems. Uh, Joni, is there something that you would, if one of your friends was like, I'm going in to do this voiceover or character tomorrow, uh, what advice do you have for me? I'm freaking out, I don't know what to do. Like, how do you? I would say just do it because I, I was scared. I, would, I, I think we drove around the block once because my tummy hurt so bad. I was so nervous. My tummy hurts when I'm nervous. <laughs> but I was so nervous. I was like, okay, let's, let's just drive around the block real quick. Then, then, then I'll be ready. And um, once I got in there, I just kind of took all of those blocks down and just realized, like, let's just go for it. Because if I just do my best, like, one, it'll be over quicker. <laughs> and so if I'm scared now, like, just get through it. Because if you do it right the first time, you don't have to do it a second time. And I, I remember we actually went through it quicker than we thought, so that was really cool. But yeah, just just do it. Because if you screw it up, like don't hold yourself back by purposely screwing yourself up. If you just let loose, it's so much easier. So much easier. Yeah, I think to add to that, nervousness and excitement are not very different from one another. So if you're very nervous about something, you can pretty easily trick yourself into saying that uh, you know, this is this is something that I'm pumped up about. This, yes. this is something I'm really enthusiastic. I'm gonna get this done. Yeah, I think it's just because I just didn't want to screw up, and I think that's a good thing to have too. It's a healthy thing to have to not want to screw up, because then you know you try harder, and then once you're done with it, you realize it wasn't so bad. <laughs> awesome. Um, so now, after you do all of the recording, the voices, you have to edit together a radio play, and. This is me editing the radio play in my garage on a lawn chair with the garage door opener with Cubase, which is a like piece fun. of software. And I sat there for many days watching cars drive past and neighbors walking by, and then I have to like dump the volume really quick, like, because yeah. there's somebody having a like diarrhea in the, in the episode or something, <laughs> like screaming about something. And I'm like, oh, I want my neighbors to think I'm all that weird. <laughs> So like list sitting in the, but it was a nice peaceful place to just sit outside and, and edit that stuff. Um, so what is a radio play? It's a, a linear audio edit of all the character voices, temp sound effects, temp music before the animation begins. Because all of the audio in this is done first and then the animation is last. So listen to this, you know, listen to it many times. How does it feel? Uh, can your friends under the, understand the story? The answer in this case was no, many times, so I had to keep go back, going back and editing. 
Make sure the story flows, adjust the timing, solve your major storytelling problems if you can, uh, pick the best lines of dialogue because you'll have like five versions of Joni screaming something, and you need to, you know, or can we, can we superimpose this character at the same time that the other one is yelling something else? Can we recontextualize what that person said? That's like an interesting way of writing while you're doing this editing. Um, you can re-record some lines in this stage if you have access to the um, voice actors. Now, if you start changing things after the animation begins, it is a mess and the animator will kill you. <laughs> so last note on this whole thing is get notes and help and ask some people you trust to give you notes and criticism. Uh, find people with a variety of tastes, professional experience. I went to, I, I spent money to hire professional screenwriting consultants who give courses. I went to uh, DreamWorks Animation and talked to a direct, main, a huge director there and played it for him. Like, can you please just give me some advice here? Is this terrible? What can I fix? Uh, Played it to my wife a bunch of times, she heard it many times, and, and she actually gave some really good advice towards the end. So you don't always need, like, I just try to play it to a bunch of different people uh, and get their, like, try to feel what, is it working? Is this thing translated? And be sure to thank everyone for their time and help, uh, even if you don't follow their advice, um, but get as much writing help as you can, uh, because this is the make or break element of making a cartoon, the writing, it's like 90% of it. Uh, so if, if you're in a place where you find this isn't working and I'm stuck, you have to just get creative with your problem solving and adapt. You know, fuck the script, just make the scene work. You, you can't be in this rigid, like, well, that's what I wrote in the script, and if I don't make the scene the same as the script, then I didn't do a good job or something. Like, no, you just gotta make it work. Like, get through, make that scene work, cut out the lines, change something, Make it work by itself. Um, you can uh, add text on the screen with someone holding a sign. You can, a uh, random character pops in to say something that wasn't there before. You can delete a line. This is sometimes a magic solution that you would never think of. Like, what happens if I just kill that line? Does suddenly the scene work? Maybe so. Um, you can distract and misdirect from the flaw. Like, if there was really bad audio on something somehow, then make it worse. Just try to do something to compromise to, to get that uh, scene going. All right, text animatic. What the hell is a text animatic? I gave Lance, our animator, the radio play with a text animatic. Ben Lee is here, he's an animator. Sorry to call you out in the middle of the panel, Ben. But can you tell me, has any, have you ever seen a text animatic or has ever, anyone ever done one? Uh, not, not really. See, there you go. Uh, so, <laughs> Since we didn't do a storyboard, Ben is a storyboard artist right now, we didn't do a storyboard and we just jumped, we were going to jump straight into rough animation uh, because Lance had already started working on a bunch of it. Um, I edited, video edited to get together a list of camera shots and moves synced to the audio. So I gave Lance, the animator, just a video of the audio and then close up on this character close up on that character, just written in text. And there was some scenes in there that are still not been completed that are just placeholders that say close up on, on this or that. So we did that in place of a storyboard, unfortunately. Here's an example. Wide shot, Dr. Zira squats over the litter box. Um, so I would just write, all you would see in that video shot was, you'd hear a bunch of diarrhea in the background, and it would say, Dr. wide shot, Dr. Zira squats over the litter box. It's kind of just camera directions, but in a video format. Step number 10, rewriting. Wait a minute, we're already this far into the project and now we're rewriting? I went on a hike with Brendan Small a few months ago and I had already turned in the final draft to Lance. The animation was already going. And at the end of the hike, I was like, oh, I should play Brendan the stupid cartoon that I have on my phone. Here it is. And he watched it, and I could see that he started checking out after like five minutes. And it, it kind of seemed, I could see he was thinking. And I was like, yeah, so there, there you go, there's that. Next topic, anyway, how you doing? You know, and 
he's like, you know, I have some suggestions on that on that TV pilot. I, I think that I think that we could make some changes to that thing to fix it up. And I was like, oh, I already turned it in. I, I can't go back and change the dialogue and go back to re-record. He's like, yeah, but I really think you should. You're not done yet. You think you're done, but you're not done. You've got to get in there and fix some stuff because uh, I have some ideas for how you could. Uh, and I was like totally resistant. I'm like. Yeah, but I'm already working on a new album or something. This thing's going to come out, and I'm going to try to screen it at LA Comic Con, and it's only like two months away. I'm like, Lance is going to kill me if I go back and change stuff. And I have this. I was pretty strict about the rule of like, these are the steps. We're not going to break the rules. And finally, he was like, Why don't you send me the the, the rough video? I'll watch it and I'll give you the notes on what I think how you can improve this thing. Like, all right, okay, well, I can't turn you down because you're Brendan Small of Metalocalypse, and you probably know what you're talking about, you're gonna make this thing better. So I sent it over, and you know, I'm sitting there nervously for weeks, just like, when is Brendan gonna send me the notes? Because now it's six weeks until the premiere, the screening, this is, you know, what's gonna happen? So he finally sent me back. He was like, what you need to do is go back and get Dweezil to come back and re-record some narration in the beginning to set up the story and tell who the characters are, what they're trying to accomplish, and where they're at, and what the premise of this show is. So that's what we did. We went back and recorded those initial scenes in the very beginning of the show where Weasel's like, hey, I'm Carrie, and this is the Oracle of Outer Space. We're out here doing this. This is who we are. These are the characters in the show. Because before that, it just started in, and you're watching, and you're like, I don't understand anything. It makes no sense. When we first played it to the script consultant, she watched it, she was like, yeah, that was a hot mess, and I had no idea what the fuck was going on. <laughs> and it was amazing to hear this lady use that sharp language. It was like, okay. She's like, yeah, you need to start on page like 12 or something, yeah. <laughs> page 30. Yeah. It doesn't start until page 12. So yeah, I'm like, oh my gosh. Out, oh, so. It was brutal. The writing was totally brutal and exhausting, and you just you just want to be done with this phase of it. But it, the writing almost never ends. Like we still, I feel like we go back and fix the show because you keep learning every day as you watch it. Like, oh, I could have fixed that. Could have done that better. Yeah. I learned another idea. You know, anytime. One thing to mention on that is that sort of the difference in energy and tone in those different parts of the project. So the initial phase was extremely chaotic. Uh, all three of us were working on that same Google document. We were all adding things in, deleting things. It was extremely fluid and extremely um, wild. It was really chaotic at that point. Uh, once we got to this stage, it was extremely uh, small, contained, very detail-oriented. So Carl and I spent uh, a couple of times on the phone reading through the entire script together and judging each individual line. Uh, so do we need to remove this? What if we shifted this line up to this area earlier in the script? Uh, so it went from this wild free-for-all of just creativity to very fine micro-adjustments, very fine detail work uh, with the, the, the final, uh, what is now hopefully the final version of the, the cartoon. <laughs> yeah. <I like> <laughs> That is true, and it was, uh, I, I feel like we're now in a position to make something even better, and we've joked about like, let's just redo the whole thing, or let's just <laughs> ignore episode one and write episode two, yeah. let's just, like, I feel like I'm in a place now, like, oh, I'm a hundred times better than I was when we first started this thing. Right, and it's important to go through that process, otherwise yeah. we would not have gotten to the stage that we're at, where we have that feeling that we can do something better next time. Yeah, and Brendan Small, this entire time, he kept telling me, like, um, yeah, you got to go back and redo this thing. And I'm like, I, oh, this is crippling. I can't go back and redo it again. It's already been going on for a year. I'm so tired of it. But he, he would be like, and I'd be like, yeah, we made all these mistakes. He's like, no, 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 that's not mistakes. That's just part of the process. That's how you get, it's always a mess. And I'm like, I can't imagine working in a, <laughs> in a situation where you just keep failing over and over until... Finally, you have something to watch. It's, it's amazing. 
All right, final animation. And as you can see, these step numbers are jumping because I had to skip certain sections. Uh, this is Lance Myers, our animator. He uses Flash, he's mega talented, and I've never met him or even talked on the phone. And so I'll just email him stuff and be like, hey Lance, can you do this thing? So like, yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, and then, like two or three weeks later, you get it back. So it's, it's kind of crazy. I discovered him at random when I was learning a little bit of the flash animation stuff, and I typed in, I don't know, flash animation, and one of his videos came up, and I, it was called Skip and Lester, and I just thought it was the most hilarious thing where this one guy walks up to another guy and says, hi, I'm looking for the bathroom, and the other guy says, yes, I'm a bathroom. And then the other guy like stands there for a moment like, what, what? Yes, I'm a bathroom. Is that number one or number two? And like, I'm a bathroom. And like, that was the end of the thing. And I loved his animation style, I loved the humor, and I was like, I have to hire this guy to make a cartoon sometime. So that is Lance, if you need to contact him for bathroom things, lancefever.com. He works in Austin, Texas. He runs, uh, I think he's pretty high up now in a video game animation company. Um, tips on hiring an animator. We were very lucky because I had worked with Lance for like 10 years at this point. And I would have him do t-shirt designs and just, you know, a few hundred bucks here and there. Like, hey, I need an album cover. Can you do an album cover? Or, or um, I need a, a painting of this thing. Or whatever. Okay, I hired him to do a book cover for me one time that never got used with this amazing painting, which I still need to use somehow. Um, so it's an unusual situation. And by the point that we were doing this cartoon, he was kind of in that band member situation almost, like a punk rock, like, Let's do this thing. And I somehow, we ended up spending, we raised about 12000 on Kickstarter, thanks to having high profile people like Joni and all these great actors and people out there spreading the word. Because there's no way I could have raised that money to do this thing without everybody else supporting it. Um, but that, even the $12,000 is very low to get this sort of thing made. Uh, I was talking to Brendan and he said, you know, I told him, yeah, it's going to be about $12,000. He's like, huh, really? That's kind of weird. I would usually spend like $350,000 to make something like that. I'm like, okay, poor Lance. Like, so, uh, we somehow got Lance, you know, almost like a band member at this point where he's spending his own time, even though he is being paid all of the money we made from Kickstarter. It immediately went towards him. Uh, my general advice in hiring people is pay them fairly, be respectful and humble, thank them for their hard work, and make their job as easy as possible. Do your job so they can easily do theirs. Questions? Q&A. Yay! Hey. There's a question. We're hoping once we, once, it's kind of like getting the crippling problem out of your head of creating the thing in the first place. Once we get the final animation in the next couple of weeks from Lance, then we're gonna start sending it out to uh, agents and managers to try to set up meetings, to try to pitch it to networks. Uh, and if you are an agent or manager, please talk to us. <laughs> Uh, but we're focused on that first, just getting that entirely done because it's enough to focus on getting this thing right before we start sending it out. Yeah? Are you worried that sometimes the most sensitive stuff because sometimes like sensor, you know, animation? Sensor? Like the, the bleeping of... I'm not too worried about it because, well, it depends on what you mean by censoring, but like the bleeping out the cuss words and stuff? Oh, well there's nothing any all that graphic. I mean, Arcana does wear a... There's a lot of diarrhea. There is a lot of diarrhea. Yeah. That's a really good question and it's, it's tough to figure out because I, I came up with an option of something to solve that, but we do have, I think we might have enough material for, of random lines that he said that might 
allow his character to move on to the next stage and bring in another character gracefully. But we're not we're not sure. Yeah, question back there. Uh, right now it's just Lance, and he's committed to finishing it himself. And he's going to go through and polish a lot of the shots and make it more fluid and stuff like that. There's still a lot of weird, like, weird jump cuts and things and characters just being like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so, yeah, he's going to spend the next few weeks just polishing. Question back there, Carly. Favorite parts? Um, probably screaming into an empty room. Just because yeah. I've never done that before. I've like, let alone like screamed at all. Like you probably scream in the crowded rooms usually. Uh, okay, good point. I don't know. <laughs> but like voluntarily screamed, I guess. Yeah, because I watch scary movies and I scream a lot. But like being like on command, like hey, just scream these random things out. Just like like go. Like I remember you're just like okay, just scream. I'm like. I don't want to hurt your ears, like are your headphones off, like I don't want to hurt anybody's ears, there's people like listening in and stuff, I'm like I don't want to hurt your ears, everybody ready, okay. <laughs> yeah, but you totally did. Yeah, it was like, it was oh, she's screaming, there yeah. it goes. That was me just like, you know what, put down the walls and just scream, whatever, get it out of the way, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. It was fun. And some people have a limitation where you try to get them to scream and they can't. Like, oh, what about your favorite part of this process? Um, so I like the conflict. I like, you know, calling Carl up and saying, I disagree with this. This <laughs> like the, the way that this is 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 structured that this doesn't work for me. And then Carl coming back and saying, No, it, it well it has to be this way because then we're gonna do that. Um, I think it's really a healthy way of working with one another, and we've been working together for Almost 15, 20. 20 years now, so we've, we've figured it out, we've, we've made it work. Um, oh, I want to say, we've written, he's written tons of like song lyrics for me for my albums, he's written weird commercials, yeah. uh, what else, blog posts, you were sort of a ghostwriter for me for a long time. I ran your Facebook page. You ran my Facebook page, <laughs> pretending to be, be me for a long time. Yeah. You would ask random questions every day that were very, and I have to delete some of them because I'm like, I, people can't think that I ask that publicly. <laughs> that's, that's disturbing. And that's, that's part of the process. So yeah. sometimes I go too far, and sometimes Carl doesn't go far enough, and we got to yes. kind of push one another. Um, but on a, on a personal note, what really kind of blew me away was when we got the first rough cut with all the voice actors, Joni's voice, um, you know, John's voice. Uh, which really, this has been living in my head for a year, and, and to finally hear it uh, come out was was kind of mind blowing. Oh, question there. Do you have so you've done the pilot, but do you have uh, other episodes that you've written that are ready to go, or is that going to be like once the pilot gets the go ahead, that's when that starts? Or we've started formulating some ideas for more episodes, but we haven't gotten to sit down and do that yet just because we've been focused on this thing. And I feel like we have a huge opportunity now once this thing is together, now we can like use this as a basis to like bring in more villains and, and situations and stuff like that now that we almost know what we're doing. Just about. There. Just about. Yeah. We, we do have kind of an overall narrative arc that we yeah. want to get to with the season. Um, it involves podcasting. So uh, we're in sort of the AM radio realm. Uh, we want to bring in podcasting. Um, on a personal note, I am obsessed with podcasts uh, in an unhealthy way. I'm also obsessed with food. Uh, so uh, if I could, if I could make a public plea, if you have a food-related podcast and like a guest, I, I would like to I would like to be on that podcast. So we can get foodies involved with uh, with the, the podcasting narrative arc. Um, I'll rescind my resignation. It's also funny that our recent projects they tend to end with food somehow at the end of the thing, like or the diarrhea. album that we wrote, like what? Or diarrhea. Or diarrhea. You know, or diarrhea. One way or out the other, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> 
let's go here real quick. Where do you listen to your director before you? <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, yeah. That'll ha I'll have to put that out as a bonus thing with the, <laughs> with the episode. Because it's so embarrassing and bad. Are we Meet one. Pew, pew. Yeah. Pew, it's awful. Pew, the, pew. the best part to me is at the beginning when Dr. Zeroz is urinating. All you could hear was Carl going, psst, 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 this is me, oh this is me. But I mean, part of the reason I did that was before we did the recording, I wanted to go through and time the whole thing do all the voices and see how they would lay out because you don't want to be like oh now it's twice as long again we got to go back and edit the fucking thing before we record tomorrow so just having it timed out um oh some questions back there Yes, I was like, all right, is it okay if I send you money right now? And I was like, well, do you, you want to see if I'm good? <laughs> like, I, I know, was so I, confused. I, I, I had met her in person one time, and I watched some YouTube videos to like check out her voice and see like, oh wow, she's really friendly. And she's good, like she's you know so really. So me a jerk. Huh? <laughs> you made me a jerk. Yeah, you made me play a jerk. But it's you know. Is it, you have to watch somebody on YouTube or and just get a vibe of like, oh, I, I think they can do this sort of character. And like, that's as concrete as it got. That's a good question, um, I didn't know that either. <laughs> uh, but so. I want to try to answer the question, though, clearly, is um, I did get a commitment up front from Weasel Zappa and from John Schnepp before I started the Kickstarter. Um, and being like, I'm going to launch this Kickstarter do you guys want to do this? And if so, please let me know ASAP so that I can use your name and promote it and then hopefully get other people involved. But I happen to know John Schnepp just from around LA and working and stuff and working in filmmaking. I've helped uh, him on his Superman Lives documentary. I was the cinematographer. And we had just been friends and hung out and worked on weird stuff throughout the years. Um, so I knew him, and he was just willing to just, oh, let's just do it. Um, but Dweezil had been a client of mine in video production, so I'd go and follow him around and shoot blog, you know, blogs or promotional videos. And I just tried to, like, kind of pull from those resources. And, like, Dweezil had done some voice acting years ago as Duck Bear, I think, and some random film stuff, and he was kind of a friend working together so often. He hired me to, like, document the recording of his entire album and stuff like that. So we got to be close enough to where he trusted me enough and be like, hey, I have this project here. And having the design of the poster up front was huge. Like going to Lance and being like, I want the characters. So it looks really cool. And then I can go, Dweezil, here's really cool artwork. You want to be in this thing. You know, do you trust me enough to put your name behind this thing and trust that I'll follow through and make it good? So it's kind of like, Build it and they will come. Like build the first thing, get this person on board, then build the next thing, and then once you have that person on board, get another person on board. Like kind of building it that way. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. More questions? There's one. Hi, uh, I'm Matt Major, I'm a writer. Uh, I guess my only question is if I, I don't know the whole process, I'm, I'm a comic book uh, The only thing I find fuzzy on is I think that people still do some pitch books. Like Brendan was telling me that, and I don't know if I'm supposed to say it. I think I can say this, but he got a new. He's got some new thing going. And sold a show vaguely and, and, and to do a, some kind of development pilot, something, and. He told me that he was doing a character bible and you know, 
doing like treatment and all that stuff, which is I think the traditional way of like, first you gotta do a little baby steps and get the, and all those things. But my whole point was, I went and met with Brendan and I was like, looks like there's two paths to go. Should I do all those painful baby steps of trying to do a character Bible? I'm trying to do all this slow stuff. It could take years, I could never get a meeting, I could never get green lit. Or should I just fucking put it out? Because I have, I can, I think I can make like ten thousand dollars. We put this whole thing together and promote it, like make, get the funds to make it happen. And he was like, you know, that's up to you, whichever way you want to go. And I was like, all right, fine, I'm just gonna do it. That's <laughs> like, I'm just too impatient to go and deal with going like, oh, I gotta go. Who, who am I gonna go to and ask them if I can make a cartoon? I have no clue. Like, I honestly still don't know where I could drive over to, like, Cartoon Network in Burbank and knock on the door and be like, hey, I want to make a cartoon. Like, <laughs> well, so, that's what's so great about conventions, too, is there's yeah. a lot of networking that you can do. Like, WonderCon, LA, Comic Con, like, just all these conventions. Like, I, I've, I mean, that's how I got to be where I was. I mean, just cosplaying, I get to do something that I never knew that I would love so much. So, it's, that's and Nobody gave you permission to do it. Sorry. Wait, what? <laughs> I just did it anyway. No, but I mean, that's what you mean. You just built this sort of business yeah, doing your actually, thing. Yeah, yeah there was no structure. Doing. You just, yeah. a you lot know? of things in, in the creative world, I feel like you just have to do, and it, you'll find a way. If you're driven enough, you'll just find a way to make it so. That being said, it was very stressful doing the Kickstarter, wondering. Because yeah. you always hit that midpoint where it's like, oh boy. This whole thing fails in front of everybody. <laughs> I'm gonna go have to find a relative with some money to kick in the Kickstarter at the yeah. last minute. To yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, so I did choose that path of like I think I have enough resources to make a pilot happen and just get the pilot done and prove that I can do it and be a show for you. And instead of like, and I'm I'm, I'm always that way with everything. Like getting into videography and video production, I was like, well. Go buy a camera or rent a camera. Hey, you want me to make a video of you? Okay. Or designing websites. Like, hey, you need a website? Okay, I'll make you a website. There you go. Like, I'll go, okay, I'll drive over to Barnes and Noble tonight, buy the book on how to make a website. Make a website. There it is. And then suddenly other people are like, oh, you make websites? Cool. Here's some money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's like you just have to go do that. Thing. Don't put so, yourself in a box. Yeah. Like even in uh, modeling, like I didn't want to just do one type of modeling, like just just cute princesses or you know just scary horror stuff. Like I, I I had to do a lot of things, and that's why I'm actually you know I got into voice acting. I'm actually starting to sing now. So it's like just you know get your feelers out there and see what sticks. You know I'm pretty sure that's not how that phrase goes, but whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So does that answer the question? I mean, that's the, that's the path I chose, and it seemed to work, and we're getting there, and yeah. getting this thing together. Look how far we are now. Yeah. It's cool. Another question? There's one. Hi, uh, uh, how long did it take you to complete the pilot? So when you, were, you, know, when you started creating the pilot to the final draft? What was it, like a year or something? Yeah. I think we're like a year from we were two years? Uh-uh. Was it? Really? Well, I think we had, I don't think it was almost done. I think we had, I think we had just a trailer. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. It, and unfortunately it took a while, but I felt like, and also tying it in with the last question, it was like, I don't want to go into this unknown situation of where like, I don't know how long it's ever going to take me to make something if I go the traditional route. Like I always want to get it going. And that, just real quick, I just want to say, I wanted to focus on things I could control and do. I didn't want to depend on someone else telling me if I could make it or not. That's smart. Yeah. I think my quick answer is I wish it could be the 22 length just because I think it's easier to fit stuff in because when you're at 11 and a half it's so hard 
to cut lines down and keep deleting and deleting and deleting. What, what yeah. June was that? Oh, why was that 11 and a half target? Um, just because I wanted to try to stick to, uh, right around 11 and a half is that, uh, like a, a 15 minute time slot is an 11 and a half minute show with room for commercials. So I wanted to just try to hit the industry standard. And what the advice that some people gave me, like Brendan told me, you know what, if you have to make it three minutes and make it awesome, make it three minutes and make it awesome. And I was like, all right, well, I still want to try to hit it. And then uh, our friend at DreamWorks Animation said, um, he said, I would challenge you to try to stick to the industry standards as an exercise, and it will make you a better writer if you can try to fit it in to 11 and a half. Because I was like, should I just not worry about it and go overtime? And he's like, no, you should do this just for yourself, just to, you know, achieve that. Yeah, the, the constraints actually help with the creative process, so knowing that we can't just go over, we can't just say, well, you know, the, these are funny lines, we'll leave them in, who cares if it's 20 minutes or 40 minutes, and we'll, we'll deal with it. If we're very strict and we say, well, it has to be 11 and a half, um, you're left with only the best that you can do, and then make more episodes. Did that answer? Cool. I think there's a question back there. Is there a question? Oh, there's a question way back there. <laughs> So, uh, what do you think led to the successful uh, Kickstarter? And what kind of materials did you show? Did you show any sketches, or what do you think helped with? I think that? you asked what would, what is it that made a successful Kickstarter? Uh, yes. Uh, the materials on it. Um, I wanted everything to convey that I could seriously make it the rest of the way, if I just could make it to that funding goal to pay for this specific thing that's an exact amount that I need to write a check to Lance the animator and send it to him. Um, I feel like that's hard too without like any animation. It's really hard to like yeah. picture. Yeah, well that's why up front I paid him money just to do like, can you just do these characters with some minimal animation? Like Dr. Xeroz kind of floats up and down and has a thing going around his head. Um, uh, Arcana does something, I can't remember what. She's like holding a plunger and some water's dripping off of it. And it was like just basic. <laughs> Basic little motions and to just prove the proof of concept and then having the the names associated with it helped obviously because then Dweezil uh, could post to his whatever fans, hey I'm going to be in this cartoon. But still, even with all that, it's a challenge to even make it to that point, which is kind of crazy. Like I, you would always think like, oh if I can get all these names, and this person has two million followers on Facebook, this person's got... 50,000 Twitter followers or whatever, still just a small percentage will come through and kick in a dollar. Yeah, it's a group effort. Yeah. Definitely all of us pushing. And it's just pushing and pushing and pushing. So it's like a marathon for 30 days to try to come up with an interesting way to tell a story that day. And that's why we have to be so enthusiastic about it too. Like if we don't believe it, then we wouldn't pitch it to other people and tell yeah. them to believe it. Like. I remember that, I was like, no, this is going to be awesome. And <laughs> I know because I'm going to make it awesome, and I'm going to do my best, and that's not going to go to waste. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did that answer the question back there? Yeah, that was perfect. Thank you. Cool. Another question? There's one. Can you tell us what uh, inspired us to this project? What inspired it was that road trip I took in the desert with my wife, and I was a fan of Art Bell and Alien stuff and AM radio. I love listening to old Art Bell AM radio. Is there something about that pre-internet radio in the middle of the night, with people taking their time and talking about weird crap, and there were no constraints? And Art Bell was just an amazing host. Uh, so there's that, which I don't think I brought to this project. Like it didn't translate, but maybe it will in the future. Uh, but the thing that keeps me going is every time, every step of the way in the writing, when we would screw up so bad, in my opinion, uh, and realize this is garbage, we've got to fix this thing. Like, we'd actually come up with the solution to what would fix it. Be like, okay, we got it. Like, we're going to get there. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so, and then that feeling that I have right now is like, oh, now if I started something, I could do way better. Which is like, all right, cool. <laughs> not, not saying that this is bad, but uh, now if we do episode two, it would not suffer from the same mistakes that episode one. And I think that's typical when you're working on a TV show. You go back and watch the first episode of the original Star Trek, and you're like, what the hell is going on? That was a magical man. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of the purpose of a pilot, I think, is to work out all these problems and figure out what's going on. Just see the potential, too. Yeah. yeah. Another question? I like all the questions. Yeah, they good. Like, I've learned a lot, so that's good. <laughs> I like that. Uh, so the final Well, it was like 12000 in um, kickstarting, and then I spent like a few thousand out of pocket on voice acting and random stuff. So everybody on this is getting paid before I ever get paid anything. It's, it's a financial loss for me right now. It's a passion project. Yeah. But it's a huge creative project that I'm learning from. It's hugely educational to just force yourself to go through the steps. So it's kind of like going to college. And like, oh, I spent a few thousand dollars and learned a lot about making a cartoon. Yeah. Is that okay? <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. If you'd like to contact us or me, take a photo of that. I'm Carl at carlkingdom.com. As I said, we are looking for agents, managers to help us pitch the show, get it in the door. If you know someone, help. OracleofOuterspace.com, too. OracleofOuterspace.com is another place you can find out about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.